SCP-8833-1977. Conspiracy theories, especially those related to tragedies, are popular because people often feel the need to ascribe methods to what so often comes down to randomness. Many people struggle to come to terms with the idea that the world is a fairly random, cruel place, and so instead they look to convoluted plans that, while perhaps equally cruel, are far less random. I bring this up due to today's SCP-8833, which is connected to the Class of 76 canon, and is therefore steeped in tragedy. While the principal events that kick off the misery of Kirk Lonwood High School seem to be simple random tragedy, there is some method to the madness, but unlike any given conspiracy theory, piecing that method together is, of course, anomalously difficult. Let's take a look. SCP-8833 is a copy of the 1976 edition Kirk Lonwood High School Yearbook, previously belonging to student Carolyn Kirk. The yearbook shows mild wear and use, with the front cover bearing a three-arrow design and the words Reflections of 76 and KLHS-1976. The back is blank, except for a small amount of charring along the spine, while an inscription inside of the back cover reads, We've had a great year, haven't we? Don't worry about waiting for the reunion. I'm sure we'll see each other soon enough. Lots of love from all of your best friends. The previous owner's first name, written in her own handwriting, is penned in the bottom right corner of the back cover. Individuals who read the yearbook invariably begin to sympathize and eventually identify with the persons and events that it describes. This effect appears to be universal, and does not apply more or less strongly to individuals who are not alive in 1976. People who view it for an extended period of time will inevitably be able to produce specific details about persons or events described in the book even if those details aren't present within the book. Over a long enough period of time, persons exposed to the book will begin to dissociate from their own experiences, and insist that they were a student at the high school in 1976. Multiple people who have been exposed to the book, if exposed to each other, will display at least a casual familiarity with each other, though they will be unable to recall specifics about the other individual. In almost all cases, people in this situation will feel confident that they have met, but when pushed on the subject, they will grow increasingly frustrated and explain that their lapse in memory is due to so much time having passed since 1976. While individuals exposed to the book will initially display a nostalgic appreciation for it, and a desire to read it further, eventually they will undergo a stark change, beginning to express a general sense of dread towards it resisting any attempts by personnel to expose them to the yearbook further. The yearbook was one of a small group of items recovered from the burned ruins of Kirk Lawnwood High School in Indiana. At the time of its destruction, the school had a total student body of 322 students and 36 faculty, and the remaining students were incorporated into another high school, which was itself later incorporated into another high school in the same city. The fire that destroyed the school coincided with the disappearance of nearly all of the school's 62-person senior class, many of whom were on a class field trip elsewhere in the state at the time. Both of the events were the subject of an investigation by the Indiana State Police and the FBI Special Crimes Division, a precursor to the modern Unusual Incidents Unit, after multiple students were reported as missing in the wake of the fire. The events leading to the fire at the school and the disappearance of the students were partially obfuscated as part of a cover-up involving the town's chief of police, whose son was eventually found responsible for the fire. We're then given a summary of the case file on the incident from the FBI. On the evening of May 27, 1976, Cotter Parsons, the youngest son of the chief of police, along with Dale Briggs and Sam Wally Wallerman, drove into town and stopped at the Quick Stop gas station on CR 100 East to fill up a can of gasoline 
and purchase a pack of Marlboro Red 100s and three dozen eggs. Afterwards, the group continued on to Kirklonwood High School, where the graduation proceedings had been set up in the field behind the school in preparation for the following day's event. Their presumed intention was to burn a crude phrase into the grass of the field to interrupt the graduation ceremony, of which Parsons would not have attended due to failing grades. The group likely intended for the school to be unoccupied, and was surprised to find a single car in the parking lot. According to Wallerman, this car belonged to Carolyn Kirk, a senior at the school. Eager to get back to drinking alcohol at the hunting shed near the Parsons' home that the group frequented, Parsons disregarded the concerns of the others and began spreading the gasoline, and then lighting it upon completion. At this time, Briggs reports seeing Miss Kirk leaving the building and heading towards her car, carrying a small stack of books. Afraid of being seen and reported, the group began to chase her, who fled back into the school. While considering their next plan of action, the group did not notice that the fire had grown out of control, fueled by the remaining gasoline in the canister, the wind, and the unusually dry weather over the previous month. The fire burned close to the fine arts wing of the school and the gymnasium, before eventually catching the wooden siding of the gym. Wallerman reports running into the school briefly to look for Kirk, but fleeing from the gathering smoke inside and following Briggs and Parsons into the nearby woods. The town's fire brigade was alerted to the fire at 10.19pm, roughly 12 minutes after Briggs reports leaving the scene. Upon arriving, they discovered the entire structure fully engulfed by the fire, which continued to burn until 6.23am. The chief of police initially speculated that the fire was caused by an electrical fault in an outdoor storage shed, but further investigation noted that the clearest ignition point was in the field to the east, and not the shed to the south. Additionally, it was discovered that Chief Parsons and a lieutenant had suppressed evidence that connected Cotter Parsons to the fire, specifically testimony from the attendant at the quick stop and additional testimony from three local middle school students who saw Parsons' vehicle leaving down an adjacent road at high speed minutes before the fire brigade arrived. The investigation into the fire was further impeded by the search for the now missing Carolyn Kirk, whose family confirmed she had been at the school finishing her college application using the school's typewriter. Her car was discovered in the parking lot, leading investigators to assume she had been at the school at the time of the fire but no evidence of her remains were ever found within the ruins of the building. A crew of forensic investigators later discovered the charred remains of her book bag, which contained SCP-8833, within the home of Chief Parsons, along with several other items pulled from the ruins of the school. It was the discovery of these items, as well as an unusual interview with the chief, that prompted intervention by the local office of the Special Crimes Division. The interview was conducted by two detectives with the FBI, who asked the chief what he thinks caused the fire. He replies that it was probably faulty wiring in the storage shed near the school that ignited a can of gas there. He's not really even sure why they sent them out here, as this investigation is pretty open and shut. The detectives then ask who had access to the site of the incident after the school burned down, with the chief answering that he and his department had access, along with Chief Baker with the fire department, but the only folks that spent much time there were him and his investigators. When the detectives mention that he's handled all of the gathered evidence personally, he asks if he's being accused of something. They reply that they're just here to get to the bottom of this mess, and ask if all of the evidence has been kept at the police station in an evidence locker. He says that that's typically where they keep evidence, yes but the detectives reply that when they went over to the station, they were told that their evidence locker is full, so the recovered items had all been shipped to another station in a nearby town. When they then asked that station at the other town, they made it very clear that they hadn't received any evidence whatsoever. When they then went back to the station here and mentioned that, they were then told that the evidence is actually being handled by some third-party investigator that the detectives have never heard of. 
The chief tries to explain, but the detectives cut him off, saying that a major fire occurred, a student is missing, they know he's sequestered evidence away somewhere, and they just need to know where. The chief, however, assures them that no students are missing, and everyone is just fine, which gives the detectives pause. They reply that Carolyn Kirk is missing, and he posted her missing persons report. Chief Parsons, however, says that they are mistaken. She's not missing. She's still here, and we're all here. He then pauses, questioning himself before stating again that she's fine, and we're all fine and together. He tells the detectives that they clearly have put a lot of thought into this, but they're all going to be just fine. Graduation is tomorrow, after all, and they need to just put this behind them and get ready for the summer. This also gives the detectives pause, as they tell him that the date of Kirk Lonwood's graduation was two weeks ago. He simply looks up and behind the two detectives and nods. After a moment, he looks back at them and smiles, saying that they're fine and they'll be whole again. Shortly after the fire, Special Crimes also began investigating the mysterious disappearance of a number of other individuals, including other members of the senior class, who did not return from a class trip to a lake. The last known sighting of any member of this group was near a roadside convenience store, roughly a 15 minute drive from the lake. Investigation into this matter was inconclusive, and a bunch of text from this section is redacted mentioning only floating bodies and a ritual, of course referencing SCP-2316. The investigation into the fire came to a halt for three weeks afterwards, and wouldn't be resolved until June 21st, when the body of Cotter Parsons would be discovered in his father's hunting shed, both having been set on fire and burned. Parsons' vehicle was found outside the shed, with a suicide note left on the floor, and evidence at the scene suggests that he drove to the shed, smoked six cigarettes, and then entered the shed and locked the door. The source of the fire is still unknown. Of note were a second set of tire marks leading to the shed, the source of which are likewise unknown. Shortly after his presumed suicide, both Wallerman and Briggs confessed to their part in the events of May 27th, offering the details presented within this report. Neither individual reported having spoken with Parsons since the night of the event, when Parsons demanded that they both stay quiet to avoid arousing any suspicion. The text of Parsons' suicide note reads, Just wanted to say sorry for the fire. I did not mean it. Got scared, and Dad didn't know, so it was my fault. I am sorry. Keep having a nightmare where I'm at school, and everybody is there. Only a few of us left. I think I should be there, and not here. Mom, I am sorry I didn't do any of it right. You tried hard, and you did your best, but I think I was just bad. Pa, I am sorry for the trouble. I didn't mean none of it but I love you. Time to go. Will be nice to see everybody again. Love you, Cotter. FBI records indicate that Carolyn Kirk's body was never found, and an extensive regimen of memory-altering substances was administered to the civilian population of the town in late 1976, after a number of unexplained phenomena were reported in the area. In early 1981, after a string of violent and public suicides, the remaining population of the town was moved to other communities within Indiana, Illinois, and Ohio. The stretch of CR 100 East that previously led to the high school was torn up, as was the school's foundation. Foundation assets embedded within the UIU became aware of SCB 8833 shortly after its discovery when the first report filed by the Special Crimes Division was circulated. We're given a list of items acquired by the Foundation from UIU custody, including SCP-8833. All of the objects were believed to have been at one time held by Cal Parsons. 
First is a pack of non-anomalous plane cards, with the cards 9 through Ace of each suit being noticeably more worn than the rest of the deck. Also a non-anomalous Happy Days Thermos, and a prom banner reading, We'll always have today. There's also a trumpet that they're still uncertain on whether it's anomalous, with the name Syncope Symphony engraved on the case. Fifth is a graduation photograph of the Class of 76, which is wholly undamaged by the fire, with the exception of the faces of the individuals present in the image. Each has been severely distorted by heat and are unrecognizable. Notably, a man in a black suit stands among the faculty, although the identity of this individual is unknown. Sixth is the yearbook, SCP-8833, while seventh is a heart-shaped locket found underneath the floorboards in the men's locker room. The engraving on the front reads, Together Forever, and the letters R plus J engraved on the back, with the locket fused shut from the heat of the fire. Eighth is a photograph of an attic found inside of the boiler room, with individuals observing the photograph expressing mild distress. Finally, there's a Zippo brand lighter that was found in the field next to the school, with the letters CLP engraved on the front face, and the words From Dad engraved on the back. We're next given a testing log, consisting of a number of exposure tests performed with a human test subject and the yearbook, conducted over the course of six weeks. The subject, a Cuban-American female D-class, has no history of excessive violence or hostility, and was alive in 1976, but was only a child, and did not attend any high school. The appointed researcher, Dr. Jem, begins by asking her what she thinks of the yearbook after looking at it for a few minutes. The D-class replies that she's glad it's just a book, as she's heard that they have all sorts of messed up stuff in here, like monsters, but this isn't so bad. When asked about the people in the book, she says that they seem fine, just a bunch of old white people, and she asks if Indiana is in the States. She then hesitates and says that it's a little weird, as flipping through it, she keeps seeing people she thinks she recognizes, but she doesn't. We skip over the second exposure test, and in the third, Dr. Jem says that her psychologist has mentioned that she started having unusual dreams. The D-class isn't sure if she said unusual, but she has had a recurring one, and she can remember it really well, which she guesses is unusual. In the dream, she's walking through the fog, but she feels like she's underwater. She comes to a door and steps through it into a hallway. It all feels very familiar, like she's been there before. She wanders around, but it feels like she knows exactly where she's going, and she starts seeing her friends. She knows, in her gut, that they're her friends, but she doesn't know if she's met them before. They talk about boys, and movies, and Dean's party, but then she wakes up. She pauses, and Dr. Jem asks if she's alright, with her just saying that she remembered something is all. In the fourth exposure test, Dr. Jem comments on how exhausted she looks, and she explains that she hasn't been sleeping real well, with the dreams getting stronger. In the dream, there's the water, and the door, and the hallway, but something is changing. They're not standing in the halls anymore, talking, and the halls are burning, but there's no fire, just ash. She goes down the stairs, and they're all in the front by the door, and she knows that it's the front door. She knows this sounds crazy, but she went to this school. She had classes here, and she was on the cheer squad, so she's walked through this door a thousand times. She can tell her where the finish on the door handle is worn from so many people touching it, and she knows the places where kids have carved their names into the door frame. She doesn't think it. She knows that she went to school here. She has other memories of being younger and going to school, but she doesn't think that those are real, or the people she thought were her friends and family were real. 
She thinks that this yearbook is helping her remember, as she remembers being there, clear as day. She went there, and she's about to say that she graduated in 1976, but she cuts herself off. She pauses and says that that's the year they were supposed to graduate. That's why the door is locked. They're all pushed up against it, and there are arms pushing on arms, and she hears voices in the crowd, including her own voice. They're trying to get out, but the door is locked. There's ash and smoke in the air, and the water is coming up around them, and a girl turns to face her. She's blackened, and parts of her are missing, like her eyes, but she knows that she sees her. She thinks that she's crying, but then the water comes up. She pauses again, before saying that there's someone on the other side of the door, someone in a suit, and that's why the door is locked. In the fifth exposure test, the D-class's opinion of the yearbook has changed, and she screams for them to come and get the book away from her. Dr. Jem tells her that all she has to do is pick it up and put it in the slot by the door, but she's adamant that she can't even get near it, let alone touch it, and she begs for them to take it away. When asked why she can't touch it, she says that there are hands on it, and she can't touch them, as she begins to hyperventilate. She can't stand the staring and the hands, and she continues screaming about the burned and soaked hands right in front of it. Dr. Jem tries to convince her that she's all alone in there, and these people have been dead for decades, but she screams that they were never able to leave. Amidst the sounds of flesh tearing, she screams that the door is locked, and they're all still here. We skip over the sixth test, but in the seventh, Dr. Jem tells the D-Class that They've had to restrain her, as they can't have her going at herself like that again, since they might not get medical teams in here fast enough next time. There's no response from her, however, as Dr. Jem tells her that there's no one else in the room with her, and she's safe. With still no response, she just says that they'll try again tomorrow. Skipping over the eighth test, in the ninth and final exposure test, the D-Class slowly starts speaking stating that she once had a dream that she knew a Dr. Jem. Jem replies that she does know her, and they've known each other for weeks. There's no response to this from the D-Class, but instead she asks what she thinks gets left behind when you die. Is it just bones, or is there some other part of us that lingers a little longer? She thinks that it's something else, the memory of a thing. Once you're gone, all that's left is dust accumulating in a coffin and the memory of the thing you used to be. She thinks that those memories are very real, and she thinks that those memories remember us, too. Dr. Jem replies that they're just memories and they can't hurt her, but the D-Class counters by asking, can't they? A week later, Site 81 security was alerted to a tripped smoke alarm in her observation cell, which also contained the yearbook at the time. Upon the fire response team's arrival at the cell, they found it fully engulfed in flames, and despite utilizing a variety of fire suppression systems, the teams involved were unable to bring the fire under control. It continued to burn unabated for 47 minutes, after which it quickly diminished. Post-incident investigation of the fire revealed no obvious source of ignition, or fuel required to sustain a fire of such significant magnitude. The entire observation cell was dismantled, as were the six adjoining cells, none of which showed any signs of damage. Nothing resembling human remains were ever located within the observation cell or the area around it, and the yearbook was removed undamaged from the cell afterwards. A single, partially burned photograph was discovered within the yearbook, between the last page and the back cover. The photograph seems to consist of a fully burned individual holding up a crude drawing of a headless corpse, and a line of text written on the back of the photograph reads, 
We'll all be together soon. We're then given a list of descriptions of various images found within the yearbook. On page 3, there's several candid photographs of students socializing, and the person currently reading SCP-8833 can be seen as well. Students are smiling, engaging in school activities, and recreating. On page 10, there's a photograph of students attending a lecture. Upon initial viewing, a single student is looking directly at the camera, while subjects report the number of students looking directly at the camera growing upon further viewings. On page 16, there's a photo of a group of students sitting on and around a bench, smoking cigarettes and laughing. The students include Cotter Parsons, Dale Briggs, and Sam Wallerman, with subjects reporting occasionally seeing Carolyn Kirk in the background. On page 20, the person currently reading the yearbook, along with three other students, are wearing swimwear and standing on a dock by a lake. One of them is looking at something in the water off camera, and none of them are smiling. The image caption reads, Come and see. On page 29, in between pictures of the track team, subjects report seeing a single picture of a student holding a can of gas, standing in the middle of an open field. On page 36, there's a picture of the person reading the book studying a piece of sheet music inside of a music classroom. A towering black box sits in the corner of the room as several other students stand around it, leaning slightly forward. On page 39, there's a photograph of the person reading the yearbook standing at their locker. Behind them are a multitude of other students, their faces grossly mutilated or otherwise disfigured, and their bodies swollen or burned. They all look directly at the camera. On the back cover, in addition to the aforementioned inscription, subjects report on additional viewings of seeing the words, We won't forget you, followed by a heart written inside the cover. Next, we're given a few segments of interviews conducted by the FBI prior to the town's evacuation. An agent speaks with a Mr. Pendleton, whose oldest son, Will, was one of the seniors who disappeared while on the class field trip. He claims that he saw Will come into his house, sitting right down at the table. He knew it was him, and he jumped up when he came in, but he couldn't go into the room, like he was stuck in the hall. He just kept saying, Will, Will, where have you been? Where'd you all go? Will asked him if he still recognized him, but he wouldn't look up at him, so Mr. Pendleton couldn't get a look at him. He told him that yes, of course he did, and he asked it again. He then got up and just sort of glided across the floor to the door and then went right through it. Pendleton stood there like a damn fool until he was gone, but by the time he got to the door, there wasn't any sign of him left. In an interview with two women, Mrs. Tillman and Mrs. Patrick, they claim that while they were at Moore's Grocery, they witnessed some children that had climbed up the big sign in front of the store. They were looking at something down on the ground, and they couldn't make out their faces, but some of them were wearing jackets that children at the school wear. When asked if they saw what the kids were looking at, they hesitate, both agreeing that they saw it, a man wearing a black suit. He was looking back at them, and he had this kind of television camera mounted on some kind of stand on the ground. He was adjusting it and pointing it at them. He'd twist a knob and look up at them, and they'd be on fire and screaming, but it wasn't a sound people make. It was wrong. The agents ask if they approached the man, but they say that they didn't because something about him was wrong too. Looking at him was like looking at something far away, and it made their heads swim. They think it was his camera. Mrs. Tillman says that when they had the funeral for Carolyn Kirk, it was like that. They didn't open the casket, but there was something about it where you knew that whatever was in it, it wasn't right. She didn't say anything at the time, though, as it would have been rude. 
Mrs. Patrick agrees and says that she's always believed in a higher power, but whatever was in that coffin and whatever that man was doing with his camera, it wasn't right. When she looked at it, she could feel like she had hands all over her. She knows that it sounds silly, but that's what it was. They ran into the store to tell someone, and when they came back, he wasn't there anymore and his car was gone. When the agent asks about the children on top of the sign, he's met with silence, so he repeats the question. Mrs. Tillman just responds with, What children? An agent also interviewed Carolyn's parents, with her father apologizing for taking so long getting back to them. The agent asks about their daughter's yearbook, as it was one of the items that managed to survive the fire, and they've noticed some inconsistencies with it. He asks if she had said anything about it, or mentioned anything unusual. Mr. Kirk replies that he hadn't heard anything unusual. He guesses that she had it with her most times, and kept it in her bag. The kids would all get them signed, and she was trying to get hers signed by her friends. The agent asks if they've looked at it themselves, but Mr. Kirk says no, as it's her yearbook, and it's not something he would have wanted to look at. Mrs. Kirk just shakes her head. The agent then asks about her friends, and if there was anyone strange she had started seeing recently. Mr. Kirk replies that she had plenty of friends, and they all mostly kept to themselves. He hadn't seen anyone strange, and he asks what this is all about. The agent tells him that he just wanted to know if there was anyone else who could have gotten their hands on that yearbook between the time she got it and the night of the incident. Mr. Kirk replies absolutely not, as she kept it in her bag all the time, but Mrs. Kirk cuts him off by saying that she could use some water. Mr. Kirk leaves the room to get some, at which point Mrs. Kirk says that there was a man. Carolyn's yearbook didn't come in with the others, so they sent off for another. A man in a black suit delivered it, directly to their house. She was here alone, and he gave it to her, telling her to give it to Carolyn. He said that he was from some organization and said he had been asked to give it to her directly, so he was upset that she wasn't here. He made her swear to give it to her, and not to tell anyone that he had been here, or he'd do something to her. When he spoke, his voice sounded funny, and his mouth moved strangely. She felt like she had to do it, so she gave it to Carolyn, who was so excited to have it. The agent asks if she ever saw him again, which she didn't, and she asks if Carolyn died because of her. The agent begins to reply that he doesn't think so, but Mr. Kirk comes back, so he changes the subject. A note on this interview tells us that thorough investigation of census records and personnel testimony gathered by Foundation assets have been unable to prove that Mrs. Kirk was alive in 1976, in spite of the information provided in this transcript. Death certificate records indicate that Carolyn Kirk's mother died of natural causes in 1959, shortly after Carolyn's birth. Lastly, we're given a note written by the lead investigator on the case, which was kept alongside others within the same file at the FBI. It reads, I refuse to believe it was an accident. The fire, the lake, all of it. There were too many open leads that were never resolved for it to just be a coincidence. I think when Cotter Parsons lit that can of gas, he was unknowingly tripping the catalyst to something that had been set up for a long, long time. Too many faces we didn't recognize showed up in town afterwards. Too many eyes on a town that God and man had forgotten a long time ago. What we experienced in the weeks following the Kirk Lawnwood fire was unlike any other case I've ever worked before. Between the fire and the loss of those kids on their class trip, a sucking hole formed in the heart of that community that could not be fixed. It was as if someone had put a bolt rifle to their psyche and pulled the trigger, and the absence that was left over was more than just toxic. It was malicious. 
an agony that demanded more and more until it broke them and us. I worked a case once where something terrible had happened in a house, and the house had started to hate its inhabitants. It was a hard case to work, and the question of how much hate can build up in a place before it starts hating you back is a question that I still wonder to this day. But as to the question of how much a place can know despair before it becomes despair, this I don't need to wonder. I have seen it. I was nearly swallowed by it. We lost people in the weeks after the Kirk Lawnwood fire. Not just residents, but our own agents, too. I've never really spoken about it, and not that there would be anyone to hear it anymore, but I saw Patterson and Bales leave our motel one night and just disappear. Brass chalked it up to them losing their nerve, but I could have sworn to you that I saw two man-shaped black things blowing in the trees for a week afterwards. Whenever I looked at them, I felt a gripping in my chest, like there was another person standing right behind me that I couldn't move to see. A few days later, those were gone too. There was a lot of that happening back then, and men in suits watching us the whole time. All this to say, what happened that summer is not something that this file is going to be able to accurately convey. In the months after the evacuation, they got in there and tore up the roads, turned over the foundations, and torched it from every map they could get their hands on. And even after all those attempts to wipe this place clean, there's still a real, festering dread that we could not make to go away. Maybe they didn't want it to go away. As a final note, since it's understood by now that this will be the last case I work on before I retire, I want to admit to breaking departmental protocol. Six weeks ago, I woke up one night and just started driving. I had been at the field office in Cincinnati, but I just felt compelled to drive, and I drove for three hours. The time passed slowly, like I was moving through water, and the radio just played the same song on a loop the entire time. I think I was conscious that I was being affected by something, but it didn't matter to me while I was there. There was something at the end of the road I needed to see. I stopped at the barricade they put up, where the road ends, and just started walking. A lot of it is overgrown now, mostly just woods and fields, but I got past the last group of trees and saw it, clearly under the light of the moon. Kirk Lawnwood High School, untouched by fire or time or anything else, like nothing had ever happened. The front door was open, and a queer light was shining through, and in a way that I can't really describe it, it made me feel a terrible longing. There was a figure silhouetted in the doorway, a girl. I waved at her, and she waved back. I stood there for hours, and as the first light of the sun crept up over the tree line, I blinked, and it was gone, and I was standing alone in that field. They threw us a little party afterwards when we turned in our reports. Champagne and everything, gold watches, every little material pittance to juice us up. Told us we did a great job that it was a hard case, and that what we had accomplished was nothing short of a miracle. Said we had saved lives. Said they were happy that we could put this all behind us. It was all bullshit, obviously. Whatever we did to bury this thing, whatever the spooks at the head office claimed would be enough to cover it all up, it wasn't enough. Their bodies aren't buried. They're somewhere else. Much like the FBI, the Foundation, and the people of that unfortunate town, we're not given any real answers here. Something terrible happened to the senior class of Kirk Lawnwood in 1976, and while there's mentions of a mysterious corporation, men in black, 
syncope symphony and how we do not recognize the bodies in the water, there's not enough for anyone to piece it all together. Clearly these men in black are responsible for what occurred, and they possess some sort of unfathomable power, as they were able to retroactively erase Carolyn's mother from existence for trying to spill their secrets. The class of 76 has always been about memories and time, combined with vague, cosmic dread, and this article is certainly no different. While we know the goals of the Syncope Symphony, wanting to bring back forgotten memories of a time before an apocalypse occurred and was reset by SCP-2000, we don't know almost anything about this strange corporation and its men in black. It's unclear if it would be better to encourage awareness of the senior class of 1976, or to bury them completely in time and memory.